okay? Does everyone see split range control on the screen? Yeah. You see my wiggly mouse going there? Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Tyler. All right, split range control. Uh, this is what, fourth, one, two, three, four, fourth advanced control strategy that we talked about. Uh, and this one is in terms of advanced, not significantly advanced. So let's have a look, see. Uh, learning objective, describe the advantages and applications for split range control, no different than any of the others so far. Start out looking at duplex control. Uh, so starting out where you have a normal, I guess the ba a basic system, which would be what we call duplex uh, control. And duplex control is a strategy in which two independent control elements share a common input signal for the operation of the final control element. So you see here, we have uh, two independent control elements here with a common input signal that drives both of them. So that's duplex control and it's a very basic definition. Split range control strategy, each manipulated variable only uses a portion of the control signal. So there's a couple different variations that we look at here. Um, this first one here is kind of a heating cooling application here. And we have the two valves, TV101A and TV101B. So A is heating fluid, B is cooling fluid. And basically, if you look at the control signal diagram here, um, when the control signal for 101A is at zero, the valve is 100% open, so you get full hot water. At that same time, the cold cooling fluid valve is 100% closed down here. And what happens as we move through the range here from zero to 50%, our hot water valve slowly closes to bring down to bring down our heating power in our in our duct here. And as we get to the 50% signal range here, our cold water valve starts to open up and that essentially turns off the heating element and starts introducing cooling fluid into the cooling coil here to cool things off. So it's, uh, it's like a building heat type of arrangement here. Um, the heating fluid valve operates uh, four to 12 milliamps or zero to 50% and the cold water of the cooling medium operates from 12 to 20 milliamps or 50 to 100 and they do opposite things. So the range, the 4 to 20 range is split and each valve only uses a portion of it. Okay, a full range control strategy, so a little bit different. In a full range control, control strategy, each manipulated variable uses the full range of the control signal. Uh, same kind of idea here, we have uh, a heating valve and we have a bypass valve, which essentially essentially what we have here is heating fluid, heating this exchanger um, most of the time, but when the exchanger is too hot, we don't have cold water to add to it. So we just divert the flow of hot water uh, around the exchanger, depending on the amount of heat. So again, we have the two valves, uh, 101B being our, our main control valve here, and it opens uh, from zero to 100% using full signal. So from 4 to 20, it opens from 0 to 100. And then we have the bypass valve, which is the opposite. It's a fail open valve, as you see here. One valve is closed, one valve is open. So this is a fail open valve. So with no signal, it's 100% open. And as the signal increases, this valve slowly starts to close. So operating through its full range as well. So to distinguish the both of them, Split range uses half of the signal range. Full range uses the full signal range. They essentially accomplish the same kind of thing. Okay, what is the advantage of duplex control? So duplex control is very simple. Duplex control only requires one controller. So this is a duplex style over here with one controller signal split to two valves uh, versus having a dual controller strategy here where we have two controllers, one for each valve. So reduction in hardware is a significant benefit, I guess, 50% of your 
cost for hardware. Okay, where do we use duplex control, uh, temperature control, energy economizing, which has been taken out of the ILM. Uh, neutralization is a really, really popular one for duplex control, and I'll spend some time talking about that one. Uh, dilution control, um, pulp and paper, for example, getting the pulp to the right consistency. Uh, dilution control, I believe that's the example we use in the ILM here. And excess gas flaring, so your standard uh, gas separator type scenario. Uh, where you're separating the gas and the liquid. Uh, usually you're recovering most of the gas, but sometimes you have too much. Uh, so we'll look at an application uh, that demonstrates excess gas flaring as well. So five applications. Uh, again, all this stuff in orange ties to uh, self-test questions. So let's look at temperature control first of all here. Uh, batch reactor example here where we're mixing a, a couple of things in a tank and we require some heat in order to make it react or speed up the reaction and if we have too much heat it ruins the reaction here so batch reactors are a good example of a temperature control scheme where uh, duplex control is used for controlling the temperature of the reaction in this case here we're controlling the um, flow of coolant and the flow of the heating fluid at the same time. Okay, so temperature. Neutralization here. Uh, one of the big ones here, we talked about pH a lot in third year. Um, we talked about how pH was very, very nonlinear. Um, and as a result, it becomes uh, quite difficult to control. Um, and neutralization is one of the, the great applications for split range here. And the first stage here, as we see, and it doesn't really represent very well, but smaller and bigger valves also come into play here. And I believe it goes into some explanation in the ILM about that. Um, but there is a difference uh, between the different stages here uh, due to that logarithmic function that goes along with pH. So at, at some point in time, you're gonna want to, to add a bunch of it to get you kind of close. And then as you get closer, if you remember, you gotta really throttle it back because a couple of drops at the critical moment can throw you over the edge. So neutralization here, first stage, uh, first stage here brings the uh, effluent, and I guess this is a water treatment application, brings the effluent to a pH of five, and then the second stage will control it at a pH of seven. Excuse me. So the first stage here is where we kind of bring it into line uh, using our split range. Then it's sitting about five, and it's much easier for the second stage to control. Third application, dilution control here. Pulp consistency is controlled using a small valve for fine adjustment and a larger valve for coarse adjustment. And you'll see similar arrangements with pH also. I'm surprised they didn't mention in the ILM here. Uh, is this the correct? I think this is the correct diagram for it. Okay, on uh, this case here, uh, the controller 101A is tuned to be fast acting. 101B here is tuned to be slower acting for dilution control. And again, this is a consistency type transmitter here. Excess gas flaring example here, uh, designed of course to get rid of excess gas uh, that we can't collect and send it off to flare. So here we have a separator where we're pulling uh, the oil product, the liquid product, and also the gas product at the vessel pressure increases too much more than more than we can capture if we're capturing more gas than um than the separator can handle the pressure is going to increase you'll see that the captured valve operates from 0 to 50 percent the flare valve operates from 50 to 100 percent so if we get to a certain pressure in the vessel uh, this valve will be completely open to try to capture everything that it can. And then of course it's overcome by uh, too much gas. So then the signal keeps going up at which point in time, the flare valve will start to open. So we'll still be capturing everything that we can, um, but we'll also be flaring any of the excess. Okay, this would be where you could stop and answer the questions. We're not going to do that here. This would be in class. Okay, second ILM objective here is drawing block diagrams of, split, of a split range control system. Uh, I revised this PowerPoint this morning and the diagrams that 
are in here are one step simpler uh, than the block diagrams in the previous ILM. So that's good. Uh, you might have remembered in the previous ILMs, uh, rather than having KP here, we had uh, we had KN, we had KT, we had KV. Uh, we had the three different variables that make up the plant gain, uh, all identified individually in blocks. Um, they changed that to the simplified formula uh, or style block diagram here. And again, the purpose of the block diagram is to give you a representation of what the process is doing and a nice little handy diagram here so you could sit down and logically understand uh, what's going on in the process. So in this one here, uh, we have KPA operating at 0 to 50, and we've got KPB operating from 50 to 100. So uh, this only affects the operation of 101A when the controller output is between 0 and 50. Uh, we can see that, see that here. So A here is 0 to 50. And it only affects the output of 101B when the output is between 50 and 100, 50 and 100, or 12 to 20 milliamps here. So this is the control signal that's, that's going on there. So that's the block diagram, which is nice, nice and simple. Okay, so that's duplex. And again, duplex, uh, two valves, one controller. Okay, full range duplex block diagram here, slightly different, a little bit simpler here. The uh, controller output affects the operation of both TV 101A and 101B at the same time, as we see here by the signal coming out of the controller and being split to the two valves. This is the block diagram that represents that, uh, showing you the process, which again is the compilation or the addition of the uh, valve gain, the uh, process gain, and the transmitter gain all combined together into the plant, uh, into the plant gain block here. So nice and easy, nice simple block diagrams here. So full range, duplex versus split range. Duplex, okay, split range, two uh, transfer functions basically is what you're getting there. And here basically one, uh, one transfer function popped up. Okay, uh, consistency block diagram here. Again, just wonderful stuff here for you. We've got a controller NIC, consistency controller 101A, and we have consistency controller 101B. Here we are, we have the signal coming out of 101A feeding into 101B, as you see here, signal coming out of 101A feeding into 101B, and it deals with this valve, and this one deals with this valve. Okay, so this is our course dynamics and our fine dynamics for the consistency diagram. Okay, next objective, describe methods for tuning split range control systems. And again, this gets a little bit tiresome and a little bit repetitive uh, going through them. There's not any real logical way you're gonna remember the steps for every one of these as we go through here. So the dirty details uh, for tuning, again, this is a little bit of a simpler uh, strategy. So tuning is a little bit simpler in general. Okay. Um, Tuning can be simple or complex, right? Go figure. Nonlinearity is the big concern that may need to be dealt with. We've addressed this in just about every strategy that we've talked to, whether it's uh, ratio, multivariable, feed forward, et cetera, et cetera. Nonlinearity always comes into play. Uh, the pH example here is probably the worst case scenario uh, due to that logarithmic feature of, of pH. Uh, there's going to be two transfer functions, one for the 0 to 50% dynamic and one for the 50 to 100% dynamic. Uh, the good news is if the transfer functions are similar, then you don't generally have to worry about it. You'll just tune them as normal. Uh, if they vary by more than 20%, you might have to step into one of these um, advanced tuning strategies such as advanced, uh, adaptive gain or detuning. Uh, more on that in the LM. I'm not going to elaborate on it here in the lecture. Long story short is if the transfer functions are very similar to each other, you can just go out and do a, a regular normal tuning. But of course, 
that's not always the case. So what happens? Um, if, if it's not close enough, and you'll find the definition of what is close enough in the ILM, uh, the 20%, there's a good example in there. If it's not, we have to detune it or we have to do an adaptive uh, strategy here. Um, and the process involves detuning by tuning the fastest acting processes normally and the slower acting processes would then be sluggish afterwards. Uh, some of the ILM questions deal with the dynamics of understanding uh, what happens if you tune one valve one way, what happens to the other valve. So as you're reading through this section here in the uh, page 25, 6, 7, 23, 26, I think is what it is, uh, pay attention to how affecting one loop or tuning one loop affects the other loop because you want to make sure that um, generally as a general rule, when, you're, when you tune one loop, you would prefer the other loop to be more sluggish rather than more aggressive, uh, technically. Okay, use adaptive gain um, to, to have the controller switch tuning parameters in order to reduce the sluggish response. And that's kind of next level stuff. Remember, a, adaptive gain from last year basically broke the, the operating range into three uh, different zones, and each zone had a different gain value. Uh, and that's what adaptive gain was. Um, that's all I'm going to mention about it adaptive gain, but that was, that's how you get over the uh, sluggish response that you get in the second loop after you turn to the first loop. Okay, little note box here. We haven't seen too many of them yet uh, this year here, um, but an important one here to prevent dead zone cycling, do a split range control, calibrate the valves to overlap. So what that means is the examples that we've looked at, one valve is 0 to 50, the other valve is uh, 50 to 100, uh, which means that when you're sitting in that range that's very close to 50, both of the valves will be kind of sort of trying to do something. So the idea is to have them over overlap a little bit. So like 0 to 52 and 48 to 100 or something like that as an example. There's no example in the IMM, but I'll just speak to that note. Okay, how do we tune uh, full range? duplex here to tune the full range duplex control system. You tune it the same way you would tune a normal feedback loop. There's only one controller, so there's really only one, uh, really only one transfer function. Uh, both, full, both loops are flow loops, so they're both, they're both fast. So tune, tune one, then tune the other. No, nothing fancy to this one. Full range duplex. A little bit of uh, something to consider here. You'll see we got the duplex, meaning one is feeding into the other here. It says to the controller that directly affects the process first. In this case, it's NIC 101A, which is telling us the consistency of our product. So that's probably the most important measurement of the product consistency. So we're going to turn it, tune it first for quarter amplitude decay, which is, um, they're calling it fast. It's not the fastest, but it's yeah, I guess it is the fastest because it goes up pretty fast. So very fast response, quarter amplitude decay, um, tune 101B second with lambda tuning. And again, this involves digging back into some of the theory from third year. Don't worry about it too much. Um, but lambda tuning, I believe, brings you a, a first order response rather than a quarter amplitude um, response. And by doing that, you're going to hopefully ensure uh, a non-oscillatory response or a slower acting response. And you remember from uh, last year, quarter amplitude decay shot up really quick, overlap, or overshot, undershot, and then eventually worked its way down. So very fast reacting, whereas uh, a slower acting response would be, you know, that first order response where it kind of ramps up to the PV and then doesn't overshoot. So a little bit slower and you can tell slow and fast by the steepness of the slope. Summary already, the split range control is simple, it only requires one controller. It can be used in the following applications, temperature control, energy economizing, neutralization, dilution, and excess gas flaring. And it is of course important to know if the process is nonlinear <clears throat> or a split range control system is used. I'm not sure what that means, sorry about that. This information is required for proper setup and tuning. So in terms of advanced strategies, uh,
split range, probably the easiest one we're going to look at. The next one we look at is dilution control. Um, be about quite a bit more involved than, uh, than split range here. So that's it for split range. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty straightforward one, a nice non-painful ILM after uh, some pretty heavy conceptual uh, strategies that we've looked at previously. So there you go, folks. End of PowerPoint.